part in our service this evening, making it happen, and thank you all for turning out here with us. We continue our study in Genesis. We'll finish up Genesis chapter 3 tonight as we consider Out of Eden. Now, many of you will recognize the name John Milton. He was a famous English poet, uh, famously wrote Paradise Lost, and, and you may know he was actually blind. He was writing volumes and volumes of, of rhythmic poetry simply by composing it in his mind and doing it by dictation. So he wrote, his magnum opus was probably Paradise Lost. Less popularly, he is known that he wrote Paradise Regained. Uh, he had a, a friend, before he published Paradise Lost, he, he sent a manuscript home with this friend, and, and they read over it, and, and they said, John, this is, this is wonderful, I, I enjoyed it so much, but you say much about Paradise Lost, what about Paradise Regained? And that actually sparked John Milton to, to compose the latter poem, but it's, it's only about a fifth as long, it's not nearly as well known as Paradise Lost. But in contrast to that, in Scripture, we're in the third chapter of the Bible, and we've already got Paradise Lost, that's through. Now we're going to spend about the next 1186 chapters looking at Paradise Regained, coming back through that. So let's look together at Genesis chapter 3, and we'll be reading verses 20 to 24. So if you turn to Genesis 3.20, I ask you to stand with me for the reading of God's word. Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you for what we know of Adam and Eve. And even though their fall, we know, Lord, of your dealings with them and your grace and mercy that you showed them and you continue to show us. I pray that you would move my lips and direct me to say the things you have for me and that your spirit would work. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So last week, we had a mixture of despair and hope as we looked at the curse. There, there were the punishments for, for the sins of Adam and Eve. They're directed at the serpent and Satan, at Eve and Adam, and, and really to creation as a whole. But in that, we had the promised seed, the Redeemer, that was going to bring us forth through that. And this, this combination is, is prevalent throughout Scripture. It's prevalent throughout human history. The, the consequences of failings, the consequences of sin, but then the hope looking forward to or else then looking back to the work of Christ. We see that throughout the Old Testament and the history of Israel. And, and they sin and fall away from God, but then God rescues them. God provides a way for them. And this is what we see today as man rightly responds to God's promise and then God provides. But nonetheless, there are still dire consequences as a result of the fall. But the eye of Scripture is, is always onwards to the seed. So tonight we're going to discuss dressed fittingly, denied fruit, and driven forth. Originally the third point from the bulletin was driven far, and I thought driven forth was a little bit more appropriate. So in verses 20 to 21, we're going to consider dressed fittingly. Verse 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So in verse 19, God had finished his pronouncement of judgment. He'd gone through all the actors in the fall, the serpent and Satan and Eve, and then to Adam, showing them what their specific punishments were. He's finished with that, and, and now man has an opportunity to respond. But, but remember what I drew out last week, what, what's so moving is that before, after God cursed Satan, before he even revealed Adam and Eve's punishment, he told them about the promised seed. In verse 315, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Before the punishment was even proclaimed on mankind, they had the promise of the Savior. And Adam is therefore responding to that. No child was yet born. I think scripture is clear that, that Cain and Abel were not born to this point. I don't think there's any children to Adam and Eve. But even so, Adam calls his wife's name Eve because she is the mother of living. 
Adam, and, and I presume Eve with him, they took God at his word. God had said, you are going to have a seed, Eve. You are going to have a seed that's going to crush the serpent's head. So Adam took God at his word and believed and called her Eve, which means life or life giver, that she's going to be the mother of all, including the promised redeeming seed. Adam had faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1. now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We see they, 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 had, they didn't know what birth was going to be like. They didn't have children yet. They didn't even know at this point what all the fall was going to look like and, and really how tough life was going to be. But they took God at his word. They had faith. And I believe this was saving faith. That despite the curse, despite the punishment for sin, they took God at his word that he was going to provide redemption. Whatever light they had been given of God, they responded and believed that in faith. It's important to remember that faith is how people through all times, through all dispensations, were saved. Even though we have different dispensations, uh, we, we just moved from innocence, then into conscience, we'll go to human government, to promise, to law. But even through all those, man was still saved by faith. Throughout Romans and, and the, Old, or the New Testament, Abraham is the prime example. That Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It's not that Adam or Abraham did thus or so, it's that he believed God. He had faith. So faith has always been the grounds. Faith appropriately applied, appropriately put to the right place to, to Christ or whatever revelation of God's saving plan that had been revealed to man. Faith in that has been the grounds for salvation. And verse 20 is a far cry from verse 12. And the man, in responding to God, said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me the tree and I did eat. That was a rebellious attitude. That was God calling out his sin and giving Adam an opportunity to confess and repent. Instead, Adam throws it back in God's face and says, Your fault, God, because you gave me this woman. Now, after the punishment, Adam has been humbled. And rather than this rebellious attitude, he is in a repentant and a faithful attitude. The faith is accompanied by repentance. And they were also trusting in God's grace and mercy because they knew death had been proclaimed to them. But they trusted God that they were not going to physically die until they had a chance to have children, until they had the seed. That as far as they know, they could, have been, they could have physically died at any time because that was the punishment of sin, but they trusted that God would deal with them graciously, that he would give them an opportunity to live, to reproduce, and to go on to have the promised seed. So they show faith. They have saving faith. In verse 21, we see the sacrifice. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. And I mentioned faith. Faith can't be blind. It just can't be I have faith. It's got to be appropriately applied. It's got to be to the right thing. They were having faith in God and his Redeemer. And God is then responding to that. Adam responded appropriately to what was revealed to him. So then in response to this faith, God graciously provides a covering for their nakedness. Now Adam and Eve had tried. They made themselves the, the aprons, the coverings of the fig leaves, and, and that, was, that was not sufficient. It didn't physically cover them well enough, and they knew it could not cover their sin before the Lord. And remember, that, that, that stands for the works of man. We try to make our own fig leaves, our own self-righteousness, our own works, something that we think can commend ourselves to God or something we think can, can cover up sin and say, God doesn't know about that. I, this is just for me. I'm, I'm keeping this hidden. Our coverings are always going to, to be in, inadequate. They're going to be revealing. We need a covering from God. Hebrews 9.22 we know without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. In the, it says in the law, almost all things were purged by blood, but the, the law was just physical cleansings. Hebrews goes on to talk about if, if hyssop and ashes of a heifer and these things, if that was good enough to purify you in the eyes of the law, we have a better purification in the blood of Christ. And here's the first four view of that we have in the blood that was shed of this animal to provide the covering. Now remember that Christ's blood is the only means of salvation. Just as faith is always the means that man has appropriated it, Christ's blood was the only way that Adam and Eve could be saved, and it's the only thing that saves the whole way through the millennium. 
But until that time that Christ's blood was shed, it was God's will that man would for a time cover his sin and, and show his faith and repentance through the sacrifice of animals. We'll see that next week when we look at Cain and Abel. We see that with Abraham, with Job, and certainly throughout the law. But here God makes the first blood sacrifice to, to cover them physically, but in the shedding of blood to cover their sin. Let's consider Psalm 32.1, if we turn there together, uh, to, to look a little bit at this, this idea of the covering of sin. Psalm chapter 32 and verse 1. There we see, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. When man responds to God by faith, his, his sin is forgiven, but the best that the Old Testament man knows is for his sin to be covered by, by the bloods of the sacrifices. Then once Christ came, the, the, he was able to actually wash away the sin, to take away the sin in a way that no animal sacrifice could. We now today in the age of grace, we don't need to worry about our sins being covered. In our faith in Christ, they are totally separated for, from us as far as the east is from the west. But in anticipation and looking forward to Christ taking their sin away, in this Adam and Eve had their sins covered. Remember in the very good creation, there, there were no carnivores. We, there, there's no reason to believe an animal had ever died before this point. And this animal dying comes as a direct result of man's sin. Adam and Eve had never seen anything die before, and I believe they saw God kill this animal. I think they were confronted with the reality and the severity of sin. They saw this is the high price of sin. This thing which was living now has to die because of my sin. I hope we're confronted with that, the high price of our sin. We, we become so used to and, and we're so surrounded in the church with the death of Christ. And yes, we should be talking about that all the time. But do we stop and, and just think of what a high price that is? When we talked this morning that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He sent God the son who is with him from all eternity so that he could die. That is the high price of sin. And Adam and Eve saw that. And in, in a killing of an animal, in the sh certainly the, the skinning of an animal to provide a coat, there is going to be a shedding of blood. They saw the blood. And here in a little bit, we're going to get to the cherubim, the two cherubim at the gate of the garden. Some there see the combination of the blood and cherubim and see a, a foreshadowing of the Ark of the Covenant, where there would be the two cherubim above where God would dwell and the blood would need to be sprinkled there for the atonement between the nation of Israel and God. But remember here, God provides the sacrifice. God did it for Adam. Remember how God did it for Abraham. Abraham was, he had faith. He was willing to sacrifice Isaac because he had faith that God would provide. God provided there. And then today, we don't bring animal sacrifices. We trust in the sacrifice that God provided, that God alone could provide, which was Christ Jesus. So God killed this animal and he didn't just kill it as a sacrifice, but he went the step, he, he turned it into the coats to be worn. He, he covered the nakedness of Adam and Eve. This, wasn't, this was a necessary spiritual act, but it wasn't merely a spiritual gesture. He met a physical need with it. That He covered their nakedness to help, help hide them from the shame that they had. They, they now were embarrassed by their nakedness. They knew that their fig leaves weren't cutting it. So God provided for them in providing these coats. And, and likewise, they were going to be cast out of the garden. Now, at this point, the earth was still very close to that, very good. But we know the thorns and thistles had entered in. The fall was starting. They, they were never going to have the luxury that they had in the garden. There was going to be maybe poisonous plants. There was going to be thorns, thistles, maybe some windy nights. So I'd much sooner have a fur coat than a little covering of fig leaves. So God wasn't just meeting their, physical, their spiritual needs. I think God was saying to them, I'm still going to take care of you. You're going to have to labor for your food, but I am still in charge of meeting your physical needs as well. I'm going to, to, to handle this. I'm going to still be watching over you. I'm still going to be caring for you. God makes natural provision. And we want to notice here that, that they desired to be covered. They were embarrassed of their nakedness, that, that modesty is natural. There, there's some there today that try to say that modesty is just a, a man-made construct and, 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 and that nudism or something is the natural way. That, 
is if we look across history and societies, it's only the most debased societies that, that have gone to, to, to nudism that haven't had some form of modesty. That's natural in man because we have an innate shame for our sin. We, we realize in some way, at some level, that we ought to be covering ourselves. So, so a degree of covering and modesty is certainly part of the natural order, and I believe it's certainly part of God's will for us. So that is that Adam and Eve were dressed fittingly. Second, in verse 22, we're going to see that they are denied fruit. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Here we see an example of the internal counsel of the Trinity. They're talking amongst themselves, much as when God was talking amongst himself when he was going to create man in his image. And this isn't, God, God's not debating back and forth because he's surprised, he's caught off guard. Wow, we've got we've to come up with something now. But once again, he's just vocalizing the issue and I think showing us how serious this is that God is, is meditating on it and, and dwelling upon it amongst the persons of the Trinity. Man is no longer in innocence. Man was created in innocence and God is saying now he knows good and evil. He's, he's no longer innocent. Man will never be innocent again. Adam was innocent, and that was probationary, and he fell, he and Eve fell, and they lost it. Christ, praise the Lord, Christ doesn't wipe away our sins and put us in the same state as Adam. Christ doesn't, we, we don't receive Christ, he says, okay, your sins are gone, now, now you're innocent, I hope you don't mess up again, sort of thing. I, I believe this is in large part of why Christ didn't just, just come and die right away and pay for our sins, that he lived a sinless life, not only as an example, but to show his righteousness, and we not only have our sins forgiven, but we are given Christ's righteousness then. When we're saved, it's not a probationary thing like Adam had that, that we're able to either fulfill it or to mess it up. We, our sins are forgiven, and then we are given the righteousness of Christ. We, we are under Christ that when God looks at us, he only sees Christ, and therefore we can never fall. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 61. And verse 10. Isaiah 61, 10. <clears throat> there we see the prophet saying, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Our sins are not just covered, we're not clothed in, in the animal sins to cover our sin, but we are clothed in the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness. Christ doesn't just strip away our dirty rags of our self-righteousness and sin, but he clothes us with his own righteousness, a robe, a shining white robe, which we will have in eternity, which cannot be lost. Now, I see a little bit of irony here, because man gained what Satan said he would. God had said, man is become as one of us to know good and evil. That's what Satan had said. Satan says, you will be like God if you do this, Eve. So that part came true, but rather than making them and elevating them to the position of God, this knowledge put a barrier between them and God and actually debased man below what he was before. So man is no longer innocent. He knows good and evil. And in this time here, we have a distinct change. We have a distinct change happening in God's dealing and God's revelation with man. It, right, right in this passage we're studying tonight, I think we have a, a dispensational shift. As I said, man was created in innocence, and now he has the knowledge of good and evil. So that's going to, as I said, there, there's now a difference in his relationship with God, and based on what we've seen here of the promised seed and this knowledge of good and evil, there's a new revelation from God to man. So we are entering into the dispensation of conscience. Man now knows good and evil. He has a conscience, he knows the difference, and he has opportunity to pick. He knows what he ought to do, he has every reason to do that, but he has the choice there. So this is 
conscience. And, and man still has conscience. It hasn't left us. God has increased his revelation and, and in some way changed the economies of his dealing. But this is the special way he was going to deal here with man for a period of time. As we'll see shortly, man is going to be cast out of the garden. The garden was something for innocent man. Now he's going to be cast into the, the larger world, but he's going to have his conscience. He's going to have to learn to live according with that. As we see in chapter 4, sacrifice, acknowledgement, repentance of sin was certainly going to be part of that. So this is a dispensational change to conscience. But the God's key concern here, man, man having the knowledge of good and evil, that, that's done. That's, that's the sin that's been dealt with in the curse. But now there's another problem, that man cannot now have the tree of life. I find it interesting that the Garden of Eden was not immediately destroyed. I, I don't know why it was God's plan to keep it for a period of time, but he did. It, it possibly existed up until the time of the flood. But then certainly with the flood, it, it was wiped out. The landscape has changed, so some people are interested in, in where exactly was it, and, and can we? We're not going to find traces of Eden. Uh, we, it, it's no use really even speculating exactly where it was. That, that's not where our attention should be focused. But the key thing is that the Garden of Eden is no longer for man. Man is going to need to be cast out. The tree of life pre present, prevented death. And there's some argument whether if you ate once you were good forever or just if they had been living there and continually be able to eat of it that they would have had eternal life. But it was the tree of, of life was the ultimate an apple a day keeps the doctor away. It, 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 they would have been able to live in their natural bodies forever at least with continued access to it. And that is something that God knew was certainly not the best for man as we'll talk about in a little bit. But... As I said, our attention shouldn't be for finding Eden, because as we know, if, if we know Christ as Savior, we look forward to the day in the millennium and then the new heaven and new earth, when earth will be returned to the very good state, when it will be much like it was in the Garden of Eden. And let's look specifically at Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 3. Go from the third chapter of the Bible to the very last, as we see the, the new heaven and the new earth, and especially we're going to see here the reappearance of the tree of life. Revelation 22, starting in verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. I believe it's the very same one that God has kept in heaven uh, and, and will we'll be here again. Which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there was no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. In eternity, we will have full access to the tree of life, because we will no longer have sinful flesh, we will not be dealing with the burdens of sin any longer, we will be in a righteous state, and then can, can happily partake and, and enjoy all the health and, and, and the benefits of the tree of life. And as I talked about last week in, in the fall, as we looked at each portion of the curse, that in it all, God had man's best interest at heart. God knew what was best for us. God knew that it was going to be detrimental, it was going to be terrible for man to be able to live forever in a fallen state. He, he knew that was not something to be desired. And, and there are numerous novels and movies, especially of sci-fi, that look at, at in some way that, that man is able to live for a very extended period of time and live forever, and, and invariably it, it, it's bad for some reason. Either they, they lose the will to live because there's no change or, or there's some other problem. And many of those are coming from the, the wrong angle, but they end up at the right place. That, that in our fallen state, it is horrendous thing to be able to live forever. If we think of where we're going to be going here soon, the society before the fall, that man were living for, for eight, nine hundred years, and how fast technology increased. And in a few generations, we had cities, we had music, we had uh, metal making and all these things, but how far society degraded. How in just a few generations from innocent Adam, we had the flood where there was one 
righteous family in the whole world. That seemed as man was able to live for such a long time, he, he learned more and more ways to sin. He fell deeper and deeper into debauchery. God knew that's what would happen if, if we didn't have to look forward to death and what happened after. He knew that's what would happen with man if he was able to partake of the tree of life and be able to live forever. Praise the Lord, if we know him, probably our greatest joy as believers is looking forward to eternity. It's looking forward to, I'm not saying we, we, we like things that are in this world, and I think it's right that, that we should enjoy and, and make the most of this life while we have it. Not that we're looking forward to death, but we certainly look forward to what is after death. We know there is something greater than this. There's something beyond what we are dealing with right now, and, and we earnestly look forward to it. We look forward to, to meeting again with those who have died and gone on before us. We look forward to seeing our Savior face to face. We look forward to being able to, to shake off this mortal coil and, and live a new life with him. So we have eternal life. But it's not going to be in these earthen vessels in this fallen world. We have something far better. That's what God knew. He knew that to live forever for Adam and Eve was not something to be desired. It would be absolutely terrible for them. He wanted them to die physically, but he knew in that he had given them a far greater hope for a far better future, a far better plan for their forever, for their eternity. Third here this evening in verses 23 to 24, we see how Adam and Eve were driven forth. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken, so he drove out the man. Adam and Eve were sent away. In his justice and in his omnipotence, God commanded Adam and Eve to leave the garden. And I think they were reluctant to do that. This was the only place they'd known. They they had everything they needed here. It it, it was lavish, luxurious. It it, it would have been an amazing place to be. But not only the physical things, that the garden is where they had met God. And and I think as far as they knew, the garden was, was, was God's place on earth. So I don't think they wanted to be driven away from the presence of God. So God sent them forth. I think he told them, hey, you need to get out of here. You need to leave. And it's a little stronger term in verse 24. He drove out the man. Man man didn't leave willingly, but God finally said, okay, you're getting evicted. It's time to go here. And God had to drive them out of the garden to force them to enter this unfamiliar world. And it's important to remember, Scripture is clear, God was not driving them out of his presence. God wasn't saying, I don't care about you anymore. You can fend for yourself. God cared for his creation, and they were going to be able to meet with him But because of their sin, because of this dispensational change, that relationship would be different. That he wouldn't, his voice wouldn't come to them in the cool of the day and and interact in the same way it always had before. There was going to need to be some changes. And importantly, they were not going to to be able to come to him through the tree of life. It seems that that perhaps it was was around that tree maybe that that they met with God, that that tree was near the center of the garden. Now we have no use for the tree of life. That's no longer part of God's plan for a fallen creation, but rather through sacrifice and through the promised seed is now our path to to God. We don't need to find the garden to go and, and meet with him. We meet with him through the purpose of Christ. God sent man out and he sent him to till the ground from whence he was taken. Adam and Eve, you need to go out and the rest of the curse is really going to take effect now. That instead of having light labor and basically having what you need provided, you're going to have to work the ground. You're going to have to labor diligently in order to get the food for you to live and to subsist. But as we talked last week, this, this is once again, it's to the benefit of man. It may not sound like it. Tilling the ground with, with primitive tools and, and, and not much, that, that was going to be hard work. It was going to be backbreaking. But that was to the benefit of man. Because if if he was allowed to just have everything kept for him and have all this free time in a fallen state, man would sure find a way to use that free time in in an unedifying way. We see that today, that that idle time is still the devil's playground. God knew that Adam and Eve, if you were allowed to just kind of lay around, things were only going to get worse. That's for your benefit that you need to work and labor to survive. It's going to be harmful for sinful man to live in paradise. And and we see that, I think, in, in the world Because today, 
many people don't need to labor in quite the same way to survive. We're not quite on that subsistence living that it's scratching, it's a, it's a fight to live each day. We have more leisure time, and, and especially we look to, to the wealthy, that they're not really concerned about their existence or even working, how, how easy it is to, to fall into wantonness. That, that when you've got all this time on your hands, it's, it's easy to find a way to, to occupy it. And especially, it seems that in the, the people in need are, are much more sensitive to their spiritual needs and their desire for a Savior. The people that seem uh, j- just like the rich man in Lazarus, that Lazarus was righteous to God. The rich man, he had everything good. Why would he need God or anything like that? We, we see that in people today, that when they've got everything going for them, why should I be worried about eternity? Why should I wor- be worried about God? It's when we have needs that, that that's how God, I think, makes us keenly aware of, of our frailty, of our fallenness, and further urges us on to be looking forward to the future that he has for us. So once again, Adam, you've got to go out and till the ground. It's going to be hard work, but it's still for your benefit. So he drove out the man, and he placed in the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So Adam and Eve seemed to, they, they left, but it seems like it wasn't very willingly, and they would probably, if, if they had the opportunity, they'd love to come back. Or, or maybe their children or, or some descendants would, would wander into the Garden of Eden because it was going to exist for some time. And it would be the same dire results if they would find the tree of life and be able to eat it. So God put a flaming sword that's kind of a very good no trespassing sign. That's, no, nobody's getting in. And I, and I like the idea that the flaming sword, it, it points in all directions. There, there's no loopholes with God. There's no back doors with God. There, there's no getting around. God's got all the exit, exits covered. There, you're, you're not going to be able to sneak one past him. So God has the flaming sword in place that's going to keep them out. And he puts special servants, these cherubims, to, to keep or guard the tree of life. Once it had been man's job to dress and keep the garden. In his sin, he gave that up. So now God has entrusted these two angels to keep the way of the tree of life. To prevent entry. Now, now cherubim are interesting. I'd like to look at Ezekiel chapter 10 and learn a little bit more about the cherubim. And and this passage impressed me that cherubim are not somebody that I want to go up against. Ezekiel chapter 10, we'll start in verse 1. And this has some familiar imagery if you've read the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 10.1 Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. So cherubim are often associated with the throne of God, being in the very presence of God. Now let's look at verses 8 through 15. And there appeared in the cherubim the form of a man's hand under their wings, And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubim, one wheel by another cherub, and another wheel by another cherub, and there appeared of the wheels as the color of a burl stone. And as for their appearance, speaking of the cherubim, they they four had one likeness, as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. And when they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not as they went, but to the place where the head looked, they followed it. They turned not as they went. And their whole body and their backs and their heads and their wings and their wheels were full of eyes round about even the wheels that they four had. As for the wheels, it cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel. And every one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face was the face of a man. The third face was the face of a lion. The fourth was the face of an eagle. And the cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw in the river Chebar. So these are not our round, ruddy-faced, cute-looking angels that are standing there guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden. These, these are, a, and, and Ezekiel alludes to at different times, a, a terrifying-looking creature. These are an angelic being of a very high order. We see elsewhere that Satan was once the exalted cherub. He belonged to this order. They're, as I said, closely associated with the throne of God, both in his judgment, as generally we see in Ezekiel, but also in his mercy, as there were cherubim above the mercy seat. I think that's what we see here. Cherubim are the judgment of God keeping Adam and Eve out of the garden, but also part of his mercy, that he knows what's best for them. He, he's keeping them from what would be worse for them. 
And, and some suggest that the, the entrance point where these cherubim were was still maybe where Adam and Eve would come back and they would commune with God between the cherubs, if you will, as, as Israel did. That this was still maybe a special place of God's mercy and a meeting there. But praise the Lord, we don't need to, to, to come to a tree. We don't come in light of, of a tree to God. We are able to approach the very throne of God by our repentance and by Christ's blood. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10 as our last passage here tonight. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. We no longer need to, to, to have a go-between, to intercede between us and God, no human person. We no longer have to go to the tabernacle. We don't go to the temple three times a year to be able to interact with God. We are able to proceed to his very throne room, and it's with boldness that we... As Christ's children, we, we belong there to have access there. We are given free access to approach God through Christ and make our requests. And it's all, it, it, it's not because of a tree, it's not because of anything of us, but by the blood of Jesus and through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. We're back to the shedding of blood. By the shedding of blood, we have access to the very throne room of God. We are able to approach him. And we have a much better hope than earthly living forever on earth. We have the hope of eternity with him. God is very, very honest. He told Adam and Eve things they maybe didn't want to hear, but what they needed to hear. There's the old story of the emperor with no clothes. that He was, he was naked, but the people were too afraid. And everyone said, oh, you've got a, a beautiful garb. Until one person said, hey, you're, you're naked. God is the one to tell the emperor he has no clothes. God has no respect for, for man's preconceptions, for, for what we think we ought to do. God's going to say things, and through his word, he's going to say things like they are. Man has tried for millennia to change the word of God, but to no effect. But to the man that will open the word of God and truly read it, it will change that person. God, he will tell us when we're naked. He will tell us that you are in sin, you are in shame, but he doesn't let it at that. God wants to clothe us. God has provided for us by Christ's blood. Here we saw tonight that Adam showed the correct response to God. Adam knew he was chastened. Adam was judged. He was found out in his sin. There was no way out. And so he accepted this, and Adam took God at his word, I believe, in saving faith. And then in response, God makes spiritual blessing and physical provision. Now, there are real consequences to sin. It wasn't that Adam apologized and God said, oh, that's okay, come on back into the garden. It, it's just like it was. Today, even we are saved, there are real consequences to sin sometimes. And, and, and we will have to deal with them. But if we repent in an eternal sense, they are separated from us, they are forgiven, and they will not impact us in an eternal way. And even through when we are suffering because of sin, God desires our best. God does not abandon us. God doesn't leave us to our own devices. He still seeks us. He seeks to meet with us. But we always have to turn to Him. Man, many, many are still pointing the finger at God and saying, this is your fault. They, they, they know the punishment, and yet they will not soften their hearts and repent. We saw tonight how Adam and Eve were dressed fittingly. In response to, to their repentance, God made a sacrifice, and He clothed them and provided for them. We saw how they were denied fruit, that there were consequences to their sin, that they wouldn't live eternally on earth, but God had something better for them. They were going to have eternal life through their faith. We've seen how they were driven forth. They were no longer right for the Garden of Eden. God had a different plan for them, and it was going to be hard to be cast out into the world, but God knew that that was ultimately what was better for them. I ask each one tonight, have you followed Adam's example in turning by faith to the Redeemer. Is there one here that, that you're still clothed in, in your own fig leaves, that you think, well, I've, I've done a lot of good things. I, I think God's going to accept me. I think, I think I've done enough good that it outweighs the bad, and God ought to accept me for that. As we looked in these passages, that, 
that's the same fig leaves that Adam had, and that's never going to cut it. None of us can achieve salvation on our own. We need the, the clothing of Christ's blood. I ask you, even if you're a believer today, do you ever get proud before God? Do you ever approach God and think, hey God, I just did this. Hey God, I, I, I'm really on a roll right now. I've got things pretty well figured out. I encourage you to humble yourself or God's going to humble you. Um, we ought to judge ourselves lest we be judged. Try to t take some time and look, are there areas of your life where you're running ahead of God and you need to say, God, I need to give this area of my life over to you. I know that you know what is best. Are you trusting God not only for your eternity, but also for your today? I say that often, but, but it's easy to know, hey, I'm saved. I, I've got eternity with God, and that's wonderful, but I'm going to figure it out for this week and this day. I, I'm going to make these decisions. If God's got your eternity, he would love to provide for your today as well. But we've got to meet him regularly. Go boldly today, brother and sister. Go boldly before the throne of grace. Take whatever you've got, the burdens you're bearing, the situations you can't handle, take them before the Lord today. He eagerly desires to meet you there. So we're going to sing in a minute, nothing between. Don't let anything between. Don't let your busy schedule, don't let sin that's cropping up in your life, don't let anything get between you and the Savior. Let's pray together. Dearest Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. We thank you for your provision for us. We thank you for the provision of Christ, that we can have total forgiveness of sin, Lord. But we thank you for the little things that you do day by day that maybe we don't even notice, maybe we're not thankful for, but that you care for and protect us. I pray for each one here, Lord. I pray that you would help us to leave nothing between ourselves and you, that we would get rid of all sin, all, all the busyness, all the... All the things, the weight that so easily besets us, Lord, that we would just come to you openly, honestly, and fervently would desire your will in each area of our life, Lord. Please guide and direct us. We love you. We ask all these favors in Christ's name. Amen.